Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum Yes. I, you all bring me luck. I said in Romney. Um, thanks. Thanks for being here. I'm Ethel Brooks. I'm chair of the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies and an associate professor of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies and Sociology here at Rutgers. And it is my honor and pleasure to welcome you today to Anti-Racism and Liberation in the Academy, the inaugural workshop of the Sawyer Seminar, The Afterlives of Liberation in Anti-Racist Practice for the 21st Century. And as we know from the events we've seen over the last weeks, months, years, our entire lives, we need this. We need this praxis. We need this work. We need these conversations. And we need these struggles. Before I introduce today's workshop, I want to give a heartfelt thank you to Maya, to Nora, to Sylvia, and to Dylan for sharing your expertise, your analysis, your knowledge, your hearts with us this morning for the teaching on Gaza. As Maya said, this is just the beginning. This is and has been and will be a long road that we travel. And I very much hope that we will continue on the road together in care, in solidarity, and always in resistance. For as Sylvia said this morning, our work, our struggles, our histories, and our futures are intertwined. The Afterlives of Liberation Seminar explores these intertwined histories, struggles, and futures, and it considers, as its overview describes, look on the web page, everybody, because there are events coming. <laughs> the, quote, fraught afterlives of the racial liberation struggles of the post-1968 era in the academy in arts, culture, and activism. These afterlives include a continued commitment to liberation politics and knowledge production, as well as an institutionalization within a corporate academy that seeks to police, to discipline, and to manage the possibilities for liberation and the people who are working to create a better world for our students, our communities, for each other and for everyone. Which is why, yes, we are here today. But also why we are in this space at all. Which, for those of you who hear me speak every now and then, you know I'll say, wasn't made for us. For black and brown people, for queer people, for femmes, for first generation, for poor people. The academy and these spaces were neither made for us, nor have they welcomed us. And yet, we make it our own. We make these spaces our own. Not in a settler way, not in a colonialist way. We just make home in ways where we, we you know, we're here. Um, sorry, I'm having a hard time because I'm old and I can't see very well and I don't. I should have printed this out rather than kept it on my computer. We understand. I get it. Yeah, right? <laughs> Oh, just Not old, you're wise. Oh, there you go. That's right. I am so wise that I can't even read season on my computer and season. <laughs> As I introduce our workshop in this seminar, I also invite you to join Sylvia, Nora, Radhika, Brendan, and Mish, and Diana, and everyone on the panels today to think and work um, for and through liberation and its afterlives in your knowledge production, in your research, in your writing, in your presence, in your art, in your activism, and as we all then learn together in your change making. It's been an inspiring two days of coming together. From last night's brilliant conversation with Rutgers and Jersey's own Dr. Lorgia Garcia Peña and this morning's teaching on Gaza. I want to welcome all of you here today to the Anti-Racism and Liberation in the Academy workshops and to introduce you before I leave to the uh, Afterlives of the Liberation team. You can all stand up, you can raise your hands in the air, do whatever you'd like to do right now. Dr. Sylvia Tillman Mahler. Yes. Hi. Say love to you again, Sylvia. Hi. Is a core faculty member in the Departments of American Studies and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, and affiliate graduate faculty for the Department of Religion at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. She is the author of Being Muslim, A Cultural History of Women of Color and American Islam, NYU Press 2018. 
excuse me, and is currently working on two book projects. One, A Part of Islam, A Journey Through Muslim America, which offers an essential history of Islam and Muslims in the U.S. for a general audience. And two, The Soul of Liberation, Race, Religion, and Struggles for Freedom in America, which examines the role and soul and spirit in the 20 to 21st century U.S.-based racial liberation movements. Dr. Radhika Balakrishnan. Is a professor of women's gender and sexuality studies at Rutgers University and holds a PhD in economics from Rutgers University, again, Jersey Zone. Formerly, she held the role of faculty director at the Center for Women's Global Leadership at Rutgers, and Radhika sits on the board of the Global Initiative of Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights and is a member of the Global Future Council on the Future of the Care Economy. Radhika is also the co author of, among many other books, Rethinking Economic Policy for Social Justice. The Radical Potential of Human Rights with James Heinz and Diane Elson, and the co editor with Diane Elson of Economic Policy and Human Rights Holding Governments to Account. <laughs> Professor Nora Erakat. Thank Okay, she'll do her dance outside. Um, she's a human rights attorney and an associate professor at Rutgers University of New Brunswick in the Department of Africana Studies and the Program of Criminal Justice. Her research interests include human rights law, humanitarian law, national security law, refugee law, social justice, and critical race theory. Nora is an editorial committee member for the Journal of Palestine Studies and co-founding editor, editor of Jadalia, an electronic magazine of the Middle East that combines scholarly expertise and local knowledge. She is the author of Justice for Some, Law and the Question of Palestine, in Law and in the Question of Palestine. Stanford University Press, 2019. Dr. Brendan A. Tynes. Do you have a seat? Thank you, thank you. The seat <laughs> is a queer, black, feminist scholar and storyteller from Columbia, South Carolina, and our 2023-2024 Mellon Sawyer postdoctoral scholar in black liberation studies at Rutgers, New Brunswick. Her dissertation examined the affective responses of black women and non-binary people to multiple forms of violence within black liberation movements. Her scholarship has received support from um, the Cantor, Ford, Wenner, Grand Foundations. She's published essays in feminist media studies, Sapiens, and the edited volume, Researching Gender-Based Violence, Embodied and Intersectional Approaches, NYU 2022. She the co was the co-host of Zora's Daughters podcast, mm -hmm. Uh, black feminist anthropological <laughs> intervention <laughs> in popular culture. I know, right? Like, right. Brendan received her BA with distinction in cultural anthropology, minor in education from Duke University, and her PhD in anthropology from Columbia University. Mish Ling, time to do your notes. <laughs> is a PhD candidate in women's gender and sexuality studies at Rutgers University. They study East Asian racialization and sexuality as logics of settler colonialism in the Pacific. Through a comparative lens, they think through critical race of native feminist analytics of whiteness as property to critique multicultural liberal politics and culture from the 19th century to the present. Mish Ling is the recipient of a Global Asia's Pedagogy Grant, an Institute for the Research on Women Fellowship, and a Mellon Sawyer Graduate Fellowship. They have lived and worked for the last 12 years in Lenape Hoking. And finally, Diana Fari Molina is a PhD candidate. Yes, Diana. <laughs> do your dance, sorry, do your dance, Diana. Okay. It's getting warm in here. It's getting hot. In. Okay, no. Uh, is a PhD candidate in literatures and English um, at Rutgers University. Diana researches 20th and 21st century African American and ethnic literatures, critical food and eating studies, and anti colonial thought. She uses black feminist approaches to investigate the intersection between food and literature. Her dissertation project, The Poetics of Eating, Deciphering, Deciphering Black Experimental Being, focuses on the writings from the African American women's literary renaissance to examine the ways that African-American women have historically used food as a vehicle for social action and experimented with a culinary's political and imaginative potentials. 
Diana is an inaugural recipient of the Dr. Cheryl A. Wall Memorial Fellowship and is a 2023-2024 Mellon Sawyer Graduate Fellow. Before closing, because I know I went on too long, I want to extend my deepest thanks to our colleagues Candy Berryman, Aretha Oliver Creighton, and Nina Saidia for making it this day and every day possible with your care and support. Uh, welcome, everyone. Here's to beginning and continuing this work together. Thanks, Dr. Do you want a mic? Um, do we need a yes, mic? It's up to you. We didn't and use mics before. Are you Just on TV? Yes. Well, I've learned that to be accessible, mm -hmm. folks Andrew, prefer you to speak Should she use a mic? mic? It's okay. I can hear everything. It's up to you. But sometimes it's better for Okay, it sounds good. Yes. You sound good. I think it is. Okay. Yeah. I'm learning. <laughs> okay. What's up? Hi. Hey, Brittany. Hi. Hey, y'all. Um, I'm Brittany. All right. Let me introduce the panel. So, um, immediately to my left, Natasha Sharma is Professor of Black Studies and Asian American Studies at Northwestern University, where she's Director of the Asian American Studies Program and Co-Director of the Council for Race and Ethnic Studies. She is author, most recently, of Hawaii is My Haven. Um, Carmen Alvaro Harin is Associate Professor of Anthropology and Critical Race and Ethnic Studies at College, College of the Holy Cross. I have randomly been there. Um, <laughs> and author of The Biopolitics of Beauty, Cosmetic <coughs> Citizenship, and Affective Capital in Brazil. Uh, Gary Okahiro is Professor Emeritus of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University and a visiting professor of American Studies and Ethnicity, Race, and Migration at Yale University. He's the author of 12 books, including, more recently, Third World Studies, Theorizing Liberation, and The Boundless Sea, Self and History. And finally, Dylan Rodriguez is professor in the Department of Black Study and the Department of Media and Cultural Studies at UC Riverside. He is the author of three books, including most recently the award-winning White Reconstruction, Domestic Warfare, and the Logic of Racial Genocide. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so Sylvia has given me the task of talking about um, anti-racism, liberation, and the academy. That's real interesting. Um, <laughs> So I thought that what I would begin with is just a couple of framing quotes that help how I think about this, and then we will just sort of chat. Is that cool? Yeah. All right. So in 2006, Horton Spillers reflected on her now classic essay, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, an American Grammar Book, by talking about the ways that black feminist scholars had to adapt to institutional demands to write certain kinds of theory uh, in order to short disciplines like black studies and gender studies that had arrived to the university on the heels of the black, uh, on the heels of the black studies movement uh, and the women's studies movement, black power, civil rights, all of that. And she said, quote, you are talking about one day presenting 14 demands to the provost office, and the next morning you are trying to identify the chairperson of the new department. Mm -hmm. And then Sylvia Winter explored a similar tension in her now classic essay on how we mistook the map for the territory wherein she notes, vis-a-vis -vis the push for post-structuralist theory from Professor Henry Louis Gates, the move from, quote, black studies in its original 1960s conception to the, quote, unquote, pacified, ethnically re-Christianed African-American studies. Yeah. So we are all, uh, I am a professor in this department, women's gender and sexuality studies and Africana studies here at Rutgers in disciplines and fields that grow out of movements and struggle. And we are in a moment of profound struggle again. And I guess I want to ask how well our respective disciplines are keeping up their end of the bargain. Does liberation still anchor how we think about this work? And quite frankly, did it ever? See, Brittany, thank you. Let's just get right to it. We want to go down. Um, I'll start so I can get out of the way. Thank you so much, Brittany. It's so good to meet you. Too. I know all so, about so many people here, and so it's good to um, meet folks in person. Um, I'll just speak very briefly because it's a great panel, a big panel. Um, I'm in the what was before last year. Okay, the, the, I was hired in the Department of African American Studies mm -hmm. and the program in Asian American Studies at Northwestern University. And the Black Studies Department is now named Black Studies last year after 50 years. 
Um, and, a, and a lot of that, you know, it took a lot of time. It took a particular chair and getting consensus and information from all kinds of interested parties. And it really reflected, I think, um, the political orientation of the faculty and the department, but also our research. Uh, we don't just focus on the US nation state. And it was also a move to really kind of really embrace a critique of the nation state um, as another form of ism, nationalism, which my former colleague um, Richard Eiten really railed against. Um, so is it holding up its part of the bargain? I'm going to put that on pause for a second. The Asian American Studies program, I would say, is, a, is an allegory to me of Asian America writ large. We are undervalued, underseen, invisible, all of those tropes which some people might uh, cringe at. But actually, the program in Asian American Studies, its students particularly, and the kinds of faculty student work that we do through activism, on campus is probably the most robustly progressive site of student activism on campus. Um, there are a lot of links between Asian American studies, Latino studies, Native and indigenous studies, and black studies on campus. But I would say that our political imprint at Northwestern specifically is very uneven. I don't think that we've, um, any of these fields have really um, <clears throat> held up to what we were initially called to do. And I really think at private institutions like ours, we've really just, um, we rail against the corporate university, but we have truly benefited from it. And I think that there's a really tight spot where I don't see a place for the kinds of liberation that we espouse in our classes and in our research at this moment. That's what I would think. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's what I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'll speak about anthropology first, which is my home discipline where I got my PhD. Um, anthropology is in constant crisis uh, uh, because it's a, it has this terrible colonial history, and so younger anthropologists keep asking, can we do this? Can we do anthropology in an ethical way that's actually able to decolonize the discipline in a real way? Um, and I'm excited to see sort of younger anthropologists doing this incredible work. So I think we're getting there, but it's slow, and there's a lot of resistance from older anthropologists who say that it's not anthropology anymore, like we right? So it's, it's a constant battle. But um, some people talk about, there's an interesting essay, letting, uh, the case for letting anthropology burn, right? Burn it down and build it back up in some ways. Um, I'm now part of a critical race and ethnic studies department at Holy Cross. We're very proud that we're one of the first departments, not a program, in the country at a liberal arts college. It was two or three years of work. Um, I can talk more about sort of all the work that went into it, because it was a massive undertaking from six, seven of us. Um, but it's one of the proudest things I've ever accomplished. Uh, I don't know how many of you were at Lorca Garcia Peña's talk last night, but her work on creating uh, spaces of liberation within academia, I think it's a wonderful call to sort of realize, and she critiques the, these DAI initiatives that are all about putting, uh, right, uh, lipstick on a pig in some ways, and just covering up the sort of colonial uh, foundations of, the, of academia. Um, but she argues we can create spaces of liberation if we come together as a community, which is what we did. It was a bunch of faculty who study race, faculty who are mostly faculty of color coming together, and, and dreaming about a new space in the college. A lot of these people were on their way out of the college where you're actually in the job market because they were so tired of their home departments. Um, and we we realized there's an opportunity here. What if instead of you all leaving, we created something new from scratch? Um, and so, and we made it real. And like I said, it was two or three years of work. It was, it was, it was a lot of work. Um, but it was incredible that it came through. I think I might be a little too optimistic because we just started, so maybe we'll see so all, the, all the burdens that the administration will put on us as we go, move forward. But at this moment in history, at this moment in time, it's, it's a wonderful space. And I have to say that department meetings of this new department are some of the most <coughs> joyful department meetings I've had in my life. And just that is liberatory. Mm, thank you. Um, Please excuse me if I don't understand the questions because, like, I'm hard of hearing. So, like, I'm going to talk about whatever I want to talk about. <laughs> no, but I understand from your provocation at the beginning about this idea of disciplines and how disciplines shape our inquiry and our practices. 
And I think that's absolutely correct. And they're called disciplines for a particular reason. They discipline its members. The members are like guilds. We train students into our disciplines in particular ways. We say you do this and you don't do this. You go over it. Once I gave a talk at uh, Columbia and a historian came up to me afterwards and said, I've been to the edge, but you've gone over. And I said, thank you, because I want to destroy those edges. <laughs> they contain us. They limit our imaginations. And I'm of that generation that helped me create <clears throat> ethnic studies, and like I regret my work there. I must confess to you, I regret it. Okay, and the reason is, because we conceived of it as a destination. That's right. Not as a process toward mm. liberation. Mm. You know, and I think that's the fault of yeah. our generation. Mm. We have replicated the same kind of disciplinary sort of things that other disciplines have done. Mm. And in that sense, we have Ooh. contained ourselves, our imagination, we've created these cells of containment. And I think we need to reimagine our fields of study beyond those disciplinary boundaries. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not to say to destroy what we just built. Mm -hmm. It's to build on it, to move from that mm -hmm. into realms beyond. Mm -hmm. And that's what I conceive of as third world studies, mm -hmm. all right? To reimagine what it was for those students in 1968, the Third World Liberation Front, to sort of reimagine liberation as a field of study, but also as a practice, as a practice. So we'll talk more about it, right? Conversation. Yes. Thank you, Dylan. Gary, you dropped the fucking mic. Yes. <laughs> dropped the mic. <laughs> So I'm, I'm, I'm emboldened by my longtime teacher, Gary O'Hero, um, I must say that. And, and I'll also say that I really want to honor and appreciate how, number one, your gen, what, what you named is your generation. That's your term, not mine, all right? But what you named is your generation, you're still, you're not off the fucking hook yet. <laughs> all right? And I know you know that because you said what you just said. And I wish there was more folks from that so-called generation that are willing to move where you just moved. Um, and that is to think about maybe the need for an intentional obsolescence of that which has turned into counterinsurgency. Mm -hmm. um, Come on. Okay, so yes. then to respond to your question, yeah. you know, these departments, these programs, these fields, do they do the serve? Do they serve liberation? I mean, the short answer is hell no, hell no. They, they can't do that. They're not equipped. It's not. That's not what they're for. They're they're there at best to catalyze things, to convene things, to allow people to extract things from imperial and, and anti-black institutions. That's to, to maybe provide momentary places of fugitivity escape. Um, and this is, let me back off a second. I'll say liberation is a heavy word. Yeah. I don't use that word lightly. Like, I aspire to work within liberationist traditions of all kinds. Yeah. I understand the contradictions between different liberations. I think I do anyways. The contradictions and incommensurabilities between li different liberationist traditions. But I'll also say that I, I cannot conceptualize the university as anything other than part of the, the one of the multiple hearts of empire. You know, the university, whether it's public or private, is, an, is a direct expression, extension, or manifestation of the, of the state, mm -hmm. of the anti-black, racist, you know, transphobic, queerphobic, patriarchal state. The, the university is the state. It, at the very least, it's a laboratory through which the state develops new ways of eviscerating and destroying entire peoples, geographies, populations, climate, environments. That's what the university is, right? So um, to the extent that we, that we understand that, um, no, the university cannot be a site of liberation. It can be a site of abolition, yes. I'm increasingly thinking that um, when we understand that, that when we use the word liberation for things we do in the university, it's kind of an insult, in a sense, because of what universities do to immediately surrounding populations. Mm -hmm. Whether it's Rutgers, whether it's Yale, whether it's UC Riverside or somewhere else. But to just understand what universities do um, in a discursive material in every other way to surrounding populations, to occupy, to police, to criminalize, and to fortify borders, actual borders, mm -hmm. um, then, then there's no way to understand the university outside of its own logic of institutionality, yeah. you know, which is, you know, the first thing that people learn when they come to work at University of California, Riverside, at least, you know, for the times, the time I've been there, which is last, going on 23 years, students, staff, faculty, 
First thing people learn, formally and or informally, is what street not to cross near, near Riverside. Because why? Because that's where the gangbangers are, that's where the sex workers are, that's where the black and brown folks are, etc. Right? So there's already a kind of colonial, and, and people use the term gentrification all the time, which I think is a kind of euphemism sometimes, right? Sometimes we, mean gentr we say gentrification, we really mean other kinds of things. Um, so as far as the fields and the, and the, um, the thought goes, um, I'll say in large part thanks to Gary Okihiro, the late great Dr. James Turner, I, I feel like I'm going to talk about generations. I feel like I'm one of the first of a generation that can boast of having been undisciplined from the start. Um, I was never trained in a traditional, the traditional discipline. I used to word trained, right? Because I know that's what we say, right? And it's like we say it with some intentionality, I think, among ourselves. Because the training is oftentimes like that of a dog. You know, um, um, so, so I, I'm really proud about the fact that I, I've been able to kind of grow and benefit from the fact that I've been undisciplined from the start. I mean, it came out of my undergrad years working with Gary, coming out of Asian American Studies, working with Dr. Turner, um, James Turner uh, in Africana Studies. So there's something about that that over the last you know 20 or so years I've grown to appreciate, and that is I think a praxis of anti-disciplinarity. Um, I, I think I, I embrace that more and more every day. I feel like I feel like the the responsibility that I've been offered is to do the work of kind of both practicing anti-disciplinary thought, but also trying to do scholarship, teaching, work, and praxis that is actively trying to destroy academic disciplines. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think there's a way to separate academic disciplines. I'm especially talking about the colonial, you know, the colonial and civilizational ones to kind of, you know, echo winter. So I'm thinking about the humanities, the social sciences, et cetera. But maybe increasingly even fields like ethnic studies um, are completely complicit in this. Uh, I'm, I'm actually interested in how there can, there can and must be a tactical counter-occupation of these institutional sites to contribute to the undermining, undermining and destruction of the epistemic and disciplinary project of the disciplines, and for that matter, of the interdisciplines. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a flourishing field of anti-disciplinary praxis all around us all the time. Right? And I think what, what the aspiration of the academy does is to render those things illegible, mm -hmm. to insult those things, um, to put them outside the field of thought and, and archive and episteme, um, and I think we need to identify that and, and move against. I got more to say, but I'm gonna pass the pass the mic back. Can I say one quick? Yeah, thing? yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. Oh. So yeah. one yeah. thing I'm thinking of, I was also trained in anthropology, and so people have heard this joke way too many times that I say I'm a divorced anthropologist, happily in <laughs> black studies and Asian American studies. But we have had a PhD program in black studies at Northwestern for 17 years. Uh, when I first started as a professor, that's when our grad program was and. So we might be busting up and messying the borders of disciplinary methods within the training of our black studies, PhD students, but I don't think that we're necessarily, but I think what we're still advancing are students who become PhDs who are buying into wanting to be part of that elite circulation within the academy. So there might be some methodological confusion and possibility and sort of like um, that might have reverberations in other disciplines that have led to a greater kind of rec recognizing and recognition of interdisciplinarity and the importance of it. But I think sometimes we're still confused in our training or our anti-disciplinarity uh, you know, training of students, but the students themselves are not necessarily going against the institution. So the same kinds of elitism, the same kinds of desire for a good life which are wrapped up in sort of, you know, uh, class aims are still there within students who are getting PhDs in black studies and ethnic studies, at least from what I see. So that's yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. word. Um, <laughs> fire, right? They on fire. <laughs> Here for it. So y'all have me thinking about a lot of things. But so I want to, I want to, I want to park a pin there. I want to come back to that. Mm -hmm. But I want, I want to push back a little bit. See, because. We do this thing where we be like, the academy ain't shit, we know it ain't shit, and it, you know, it reifies all this, but we all here. <laughs> and, and, and I like it. Like, I, I mean, it's a good gig if you can get a good version of it. Shit. Like, as a working class first gen person, to speak to your point about aspiration, the folk in my family couldn't have imagined any shit like this. I remember the first time I got a sabbatical and I called my daddy 
and I was like, I'm just off for the next six months. <laughs> and he was like, they just gonna let you be off because you didn't come to work? <laughs> he was like, I don't understand what you mean. <laughs> and so I, so it's, it, so that, that's the affective piece, right? But the, but I'm really asking a question about, so I too was undisciplined, PhD in the interdisciplinary field. You know, from the jump, I was like, I don't want to just do one, I mean, put it all together. But the question is, so Mary Amacab, the abolitionist scholar that so many of us follow, says this thing that I think is really important. She says, hope is a discipline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when I ask how we are tracking with our movements, mm -hmm. if we're skeptical of discipline, of training, of the data that, Dylan, you're in a department of black study. Mm -hmm. And that move from studies to study affectively conjures a notion of a thing that you come back to systematically and consistently to learn how to be in community with, which is another way to think about what it means to train or to orient oneself, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we do the performance as academics that I feel we feel compelled to do, because frankly, most of us have some fucking survivor's guilt for being here. Right, so then we perform like this place can't be liberatory. And then I, but what I worry about is are we then creating a generation of students, a couple of generations, who are very anxious about what it means to be here. They don't know what to do to be at peace with their ambition. They rail against training and discipline as violent. We give them the language to do it and yet in order to, we do, and then they come for us with it, but that's fine. Uh, you know, but then we need to build movements, and building requires the ability to keep showing up when shit is terrible, and when it doesn't look like you're ever going to get to it. And when you're talking about at Holy Cross, Carmen, that it took a lot of work, but the, you learn how to show to do the work of those hard projects, because somewhere in your life you learn how to keep on showing up when shit was hard and messy and there wasn't a blueprint or a linear way to get there. And so can we, do we, can we play this game? Like can we afford to play the game of being like, fuck this, I don't mean big, I don't mean, I don't mean colonial disciplines, but I mean the thing that happens at the point of study, right? Like, can we thread that needle a bit better for folks? Because part of the reason we're good at what we do is because we actually understand how to do discipline very fucking well. Even when we're, even when we're disrupting, even when we're challenging, even when we're going over cliffs, right? And so, I, you know, can we sit in the tension a bit of the ideological commitments we have and then what it actually looks like to try to do that work? Okay, no, you can. Well, railing against disciplinary constraints, I don't mean to be undisciplined. Mm -hmm. I'm actually a hardcore disciplinarian. <laughs> I, mean, I do archival work, I do careful readings, yes. I seek to understand European philosophy and theory. Yeah. And I think that is important. Like you, I guess, I come from a working class family. My parents never went through high school, right? I grew up in a sugar plantation, and I thought it was a fantastic thing to go to college. Yeah, and now I don't think I deserve to be at Columbia and Yale. I'm there only because students protested to get the programs that enabled me to be there. You know, otherwise I would not be there. I understand that, you know? Yeah. And I count that a privilege. Yeah. I count that a privilege. Because we are in the belly of the beast, you know what I mean? And the contradictions we can pose within that can be effective. Yeah. Maybe it's just a little prick here and there, mm. ultimately. Uh -huh. But all of those add up yeah. over generations of time. Yeah. Hopefully we can erode that <clears throat> mountain, right? But I don't know, I don't know. But I'm playing my part now, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to understand the disciplines thoroughly to critique them. We can't engage in a conversation without knowing what they're talking about. So like we gotta know what they talk about. But that's not the limit, you see? By critiquing, we're enabling a kind of discourse. But we need to go beyond that critique to create 
new things. And that's what I'm saying. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah can, I mean, can we talk about that? The status of deconstruction, like theoretically. You said you had grief about certain things, which I think is a really interesting place to land. Grief feels very heavy in this moment, right? Um, do you think, I think about this a lot because I'm now starting to see old, like older scholars also critique it. You know, so much of what we think is radicalism in the academy is deconstruction mm -hmm. as method, right? Like this is how we build disciplines by being like, we can deconstruct your power structure. We can come up with this analysis. But I'm seeing folks sort of start, start to think about whether or not deconstruction is helpful to build the things mm -hmm. we want to see. Because you can critique the shit out of everything. I'm not saying critique mm -hmm. doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I'm saying what's the method at the point beyond critique, at the point beyond deconstruction, right? And you know, because I don't know that we know yet how to teach. I don't know that we know yet what that methodological frame looks like because we've all been in this, the afterlives of post-structuralism too, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. Who won't talk? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think after deconstruction comes radical hope in some ways to me. It's mm -hmm. sort of building. Um, I have a Palestinian colleague, Sarah Wood, who I, I love her work. Um, and she has an essay called Palestinian, uh, Love the Palestinian Way, where she talks about these kinds of radical hope that sort of Palestinian feminists are practicing mm -hmm. as they're uh, surviving. And of course, she wrote this before. Um, these last terrible events um, for the past few weeks. Um, and as a department, critical race and ethnic studies, we're really trying our best to give her support and space and, and just loving her for her brilliance and trying to give her space to do the work of activism that she wants to do at this moment. But she needs support. She can't do it on her own, right? And she just cannot. Um, so I think there's something and so, in, so having this new department allowed us to give her some kind of safety net in some kind of way and just sort of constantly look out for her, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. Can we sort of suffer your classes? You know, like just like small acts of love can be, I don't know if they are liber liberatory, but they're certainly, um, I do like the concept of like, at least we can do a, a counter occupation of the academic space and create spaces where we can flourish as people of color within an, a very unwelcoming academic uh, space. Thank you for the pushback, actually, because it helps it helps me bring something forward that might help yes. um, articulate the grounds of what I was saying earlier. And I'm not sure if it's a pushback against the pushback. It might just be more of an accepting of it and a kind of uh, an elaboration of the position I'm trying to take. I think we need to make a distinct, uh, constant differentiation between what we call the academy and the university. And I'm going to say university is where I run. If we were somewhere else, I would, say, I would say college. Okay. So I think those are those are different things. Okay. So when I think about this thing called the academy, I think about a colonial aspiration. I think about something which is actually an idea. The academy is an idea. It gets institutionalized, yes, right? We create the guilds, right? We create the national organization. I was president of the American Studies Association yes. once, you know? I was the COVID president, so it didn't count. But <laughs> nonetheless, <laughs> I mean, look, nonetheless, I mean, these things get inscribed as a kind of a, the, the, the material institutional crystallization of what we call the academy. So in, in these different positions, I was also chair of our academic center, okay? So like in these different positions, this is how I came to learn the distinction that the thing called the academy is it's an aspirational structure. And I actually think that it's the aspiration that we need to shit on. Right, so I'm for, when I say anti-disciplinary, uh -huh. part of that is to do the work of rigor, what we're now naming as discipline, de-linked from academic disciplines, right? So it's, it's kind of an intellectual discipline, right? A seriousness, uh -huh. a rigor, et cetera. I'm 100%, 1,000% a for, down for that, especially if you're doing anti-disciplinary work. <laughs> Man, if you're doing anti-disciplinary work, you gotta be more disciplined than anybody else. Right. You feel me? Because, because you have to articulate the grounds of what you're doing and actually create an epistemic or aesthetic justification for it, mm -hmm. in addition to just doing the research and the work and the writing, okay? Mm -hmm. so, so what I'll say about that differentiation, and so the academy is this thing that cannot be separated from you know, the Winterian critique of humanism. That's, that's what the academy is. I mean, from Aristotle and Plato on forward, like, that's what it was always meant to be, is a colonial aspiration and occupation of epistemic of, of archive of thought. So fuck that, like abolish the academy. So let's, let's think about what it would mean to abolish the academy on the one hand, and then on the other hand, to understand universities as sites of employment, extraction, exploitation, 
etc. Which, yes, for, for some of us, it's a relatively good place of employment, right? So I, I feel you on that. So like, I'm not disputing that. I would be a hypocrite to say otherwise. Like, I work, I've been working at the same place. Now, I'll also say, however, that I hope your university treats you well. All right, they probably don't. Okay, thanks for laughing. That was, that was, that was, he, so, so my, co my, my comrade and colleague got, got my sarcasm. But, but, you know, and I'm saying this, if they, if they do treat you well, you know what I mean by they, if they do treat you well, it's temporary. Yeah. Yeah. It's temporary. Yeah. It's momentary and it's temporary. And it's, yeah. and, it's, and it's possible that you're being cultivated as a symbol for something that you don't actually want to represent. Uh, yeah. All right, so, okay, so you're feeling that. All right, so, so in addition to that, I will say it again. I hate the University of California. Okay. I hate my employers at University of California, Riverside. I despise, resent, I have contempt for all the administration I'm looking at the camera. Um, <laughs> no, they can kiss my ass because of how disrespectful they are. So I'm talking about, they can honestly, you can truly kiss my ass, Drake, President Drake. You can truly kiss my ass, Chancellor Wilcox. Like, fuck both of you, because of how disrespectful, because how disrespectful you are to my people. What? How disrespectful you are to my people. And I have a very robust notion of who my people are. And I hope they invite me to their offices to talk about this more, because I'll say the same thing to them both. Right? So I'm saying, like, yeah, so I have this job, right? I've, I've got tenure, whatever. I don't think they can fire me for what I just said, but I feel an obligation to say what I just said. Yes. On camera, on this live stream, please send it to them. Whoever's out there, send it to them. Send them this clip. You know, because that's how, that's, it's not just how I feel, it's a principled position to say, fuck you, both of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, I'm, so, so I'm saying that, and then I had another point that I was gonna make, um, but I'm, I'm gonna say the, the thing about going beyond critique, I'll be quick about this one. Yeah. I, think, I think the thing that's beyond critique, it's, I think we have to embrace all of the different traditions. I've learned this from various strains of anarchists, abolitionists, trans, queer, feminist, etc. cetera, um, folks engaged, especially with abolitionists um, and, and, and kind of autonomy type movements, self-determination movements, um, from Brazil to the Philippines to, you know, to Riverside, California. Um, I think the thing that sits beyond critique that most people who self-identify as academics are really fucking scared of, you know, sometimes they do academic work about it, is speculation, experimentation, um, autonomous forms, of, of aesthetic and intellectual and pedagogical practice, right? Because those things, those things are scary. There's no guarantee on the other end. Um, it, means, it means forms of labor that, that don't earn you clout, right? They don't get you academic credibility. They might probably do the other one, probably do the contrary. Um, but I think that that's, just, that's, what, um, that's what is on the other side of critique that most self-identified academics don't want to do. And that's, that, I'm saying that because I try my best to not call myself an academic. Other people will call me an academic and certain people can do that. Like, you know, I mean, communities were like, yeah, you're an academic, and this is, this, these are folks who are like actually involved in revolutions and shit, so like, you can call me whatever you want, right? But if I'm naming myself, I'm not calling myself an academic, right? I'm calling myself what I call myself in that bio earlier. I'm a co I, I want to be a collaborator, I want to be a teacher, I want to be with you. You know, um, I aspire to be a liberationist and a revolutionary. I, I'm, I, think in, I think within probably our lifetimes that moment will come, because I think that these formations were in, including universities, I actually think they have a shelf life that's a lot shorter than we think. Mm -hmm. I think when we think about spaces of liberation on campus, we are all on campus. And I think, like, you know, that to me, I try to tell my students, no one is obviously outside of contradiction, right? We all live within it. So, and I also tell students at Northwestern, like, if they're not feeling comfortable in the academy, that's good because you don't want to feel comfortable. That means that your values are aligned with the values of that particular institution. Um, I think it's not surprising in this conversation of, you know, is there a liberatory space on campus that I think none of us said the classroom, and I wanted to say that the classroom used to be a real site that we would say as teachers, like we know that we're in this, you know, vexed institution and that there's these particular compromises that we have to make, but the classroom, that's where we do our liberatory work or our activist work. Mm -hmm. Something has changed, and I don't know if we have time to get into it now, but I think that the classroom is temporarily not feeling like a site of liberation either. But where I do see things that are happening, and like uh, Sylvia, you were saying, get out of the institution, right? But just this week, right, it's really the students who do take interdisciplinary uh, you know, programs and who are taking ethnic studies and gender and women studies 
who then are, you know, staging student walkouts, and they're really pushing the president of our university, President Schill, who has not fucking responded. If you're going to say fuck you to your president, I'll say, Schill, you have not fucking responded to our statement. Yeah, right. we'll um, who will not even say the, the word Palestine. Yeah. And so it's really the students in SJP on our campus, and those students who are out there who have staged a student uh, walkout this week that are really um, trying to, you know, show or really highlight those kinds of founding principles uh, from the 60s and 70s, but it doesn't feel like a space of liberation either on campus either because you have the walkout, you have the, the you know, pro-Israeli journalists who are watching, you have ununiformed police who are flanking, and you have students who are wearing masks because they're afraid to be there. I'm the only faculty that I recognized who are there. And so it doesn't feel like a space of liberation there either. So it really, to me, it, it really is about university abolition and you know thinking truly about that. I mean, we just fuck it. We just saying fuck you, everybody. I'm not gonna That's okay. I'm amongst my people. Yes. Um, I want to also just keep on naming the affect that I hear because I hear grief. The other thing I hear, Dylan around what you've said too is that people are afraid to fail <laughs> yeah, absolutely yes. you know yes and so sometimes yes. what happens in the space of critique yes. is that we just be like this book fails it fails to do this thing and then it fails to do this di like you know so we are very comfortable with an academic stance of finding the failure in things but not necessarily failing ourselves yes. right <laughs> right yeah. um i wanted to yeah that part yeah. um <laughs> You know, we learn, but we learn, right? I wanted to just bring this out too because I saw it last week. Um, you know, we're in solidarity um, with all that is happening um, in Gaza. And someone actually posted, posted last week a person named Ali Usman Kazmi. Quote, the most we can hope for from Ivy Leagues and tenured professors is a conference in 20 years from now in Charlottesville titled <laughs> Post Gaza Genocide Arab Literature. <laughs> The Decolonial Poetics of Loss and Remembrance. Yeah, I saw that tweet. I saw that tweet. I was like, fuck, like, because it's not wrong. It's and I know some people are like, that title is fire. And we were like, you know, that's the sad part, right? <laughs> so, so, you know, there's also this question for us about what does it mean as we're working to be, tr I think we're like to be trustworthy, like whatever, it, whether it's liberation, whether it's freedom, whether it's a space of fugitivity for a moment, all of those projects rely on the ability of us to have trusted others with whom we can do this work who will not rat you out, right? Who will not tell your location. And so I am struck too by what does it mean so. Dylan says, I know clearly who my people are. I who think are, I do. I think I do. Yeah, no, I word. might be wrong. <laughs> no, I mean. For real, I might be wrong. I mean, look, I think we always have to, like, yeah. I think part of the thing about getting to be here, and I say getting to be because I think people see us as people who get to be here in a certain way, is being willing to be in that posture of, like, proving ourselves at least sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like, I still respect you fundamentally despite this power dynamic, that feels important. But I guess I wonder, like, who are your people? Like, can we name who our people are? Because I do feel, I mean, it's like the 2 Chain song, you know, I tell you who I do it, what I do it, who I do it for, right? Like, look, I mean, I do actually roll in bopping that because it's, I'm like, because that's actually me, those are my people. And so any of the ch projects that I've made a choice to be a part of here have been about, always about, like, are my people proud? Can I do when I write shit with my people who can read? Do they want to read my shit? Right. right? Like because I've written it in a way that feels accessible and not like it's tumbling down. You know, my mom, rest her soul, would be like, she's like, now, girl, I had to get the dictionary out, mm -hmm. but your book was great, mm -hmm. right? And so, do you inspire people to get the dictionary out, right, to make sure they can hear you? Like, so, just who you, who are your people? Like, who are your people for you? That's a big question. I mean, I, I write about and I think about and I talk about who my people are all the time because mm -hmm. I think what Dylan was uh, gesturing toward, but I'm not sure, is like I have a very expansive sense of who my people are. Yeah. And part of it's not Gary's generation's fault, but it's the way that 
ethnic studies has become created in our various institutions where we don't have ethnic studies or race and resistance studies. We have black studies, native studies, Latino studies, Asian American studies, is that we, and in this particular time of national racial politics um, informed by Afro-pessimism, informed by BLM, um, informed by many things, is that there's this one-to-one -one relationship between identity and politics. Mm. My people are political orientation. It's mm -hmm. people who are like-minded who really believe in, in liberation yeah. for people and the various vectors of how white supremacy in the settler state and capitalism and imperialism right, affect differently racialized people different, you know, differently. And so to me, I have an expansive sense of my people, but they might be my people, but I might not be their person. It might not be mutual, and, and that's okay. But for me, it's a shared politics and a shared sort of political vision um, that orients who my people are. Mm. Um, I mean, so the faculty, critical race and ethnic studies are definitely my people. Um, they're the first people I came out to as trans and asked them to call me Carmen, and they switched that same day and never made a mistake from that before. Um, it's just, there's, uh, and so, and when, and I knew that three of them were on their way out uh, of the college. They were on, on the market, they were sick of their department, um, of treating them like crap. Right, mm -hmm. um, and and so when the vote happened, and we were like, at the, at we were we didn't know how it was gonna go. We had to literally meet with every single department at the college. So much work, we, and answer the same objections in every single department, and just but do like that little in Brazil they call it trabalho de formiguinha, the little mm -hmm. ant work, the mm -hmm. activist work of literally talking, mm -hmm. do do diplomatic work, department by department, to sort of grind down the objections and sort of get people to see why this mattered to us. Um, and so, but we didn't know because it was a secret vote. So the day of the vote at the faculty assembly when only 10 people voted against, like a bunch of us started crying because it was like, and for me it was like, I'm not gonna lose my people. Yeah. My people are gonna get to stay at Holy Cross if they want to, mm -hmm. and we can create a community, right? So, I don't know, it's like, I just wanted to share sort of like, having people who care about you as a whole person. Like, some of them are literally my closest friends. Um, really, really matters to survive academia, because yes. academia can be, right. can be brutal. It That's can right. be, like, there's a lot it of is. awful people that are just, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, yes, hating me. Uh, yes. And so having people who have your back, That's right. when something, when somebody does something awful right. to you, you can go to somebody and be yeah, like, hey, this me. happened to me, can you help right. me out? Yep. And yeah. they're gonna have your back. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's literally survival. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm just kind of a weirdo, okay? Like, because when you talk about my people, yeah. I don't think of my as a solitary self. Mm -hmm. I'm not me. Right. Okay. I am part of everything. Yeah. That's how I conceive of myself. I, I try to. Yeah. And like I don't want to think in terms of those taxonomies that Europeans invented yeah, sure. for who our people are. Sure. Yeah. So like I reject that also. Yeah. Although I understand we can organize on that basis yeah. and is powerful also. Yeah. Um, and I don't limit people to people. You know what I mean? Like this carpet, this chair, yeah. the trees outside are all part of what I conceive of as me yeah. and my world. You know. Now you spoke about going beyond critique, and I think the necessity of that is to create an entirely new language and an entirely new ideology separate from those imperial powers that created them in the first place, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I know it's difficult and it's almost impossible for me, my little brain, to imagine a new language and a new ideology mm -hmm. separate from those oppressive forms. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that way of conceiving of ourselves is not solitary humanist sense, to think of ourselves not just as humans that has a kind of dominance over other species and so forth, I think is a good step toward that kind of view. And I take that from Native people, right? Um, I want to pick up on the point that you made about knowing who to trust and count on, and actually this picks up on your point too, Carmen. Um, I'll say that I'll say that it's oftentimes the case I found that 
the necessity of knowing who to count on can only be addressed in the context of actual antagonistic mobilizations that confront um, power structures and violence within the place of work, whether it's a nonprofit apparatus, whether it's you know the university, whether it's city council, something else. And I'll say that the thing that was actually very helpful was being part of the Cops Off Campus movement. Okay, which which um, was really thriving throughout California. It was a national and actually North American movement to a, to some extent a global movement. And, and the reason I say that is because it was during the persistent mobilizations toward police abolition in the cops off campus movement that a lot of colleagues were exposed, or they kind of exposed themselves, I should say. They exposed themselves as not capable of being counted on. They, you know, not just in the sense of not showing up, but people who actually actively sold out. Um, their particular formations of police abolition organizing at their campus by um, allowing themselves to be solicited by the administration as the kind of the selected spokespeople, the respectable spokespeople for those abolitionist struggles, who then went on to make compromises without consent from the rest of the organizers. And the, I'm talking about faculty folks, right? Went, 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 went behind everyone's back, talked to, y'all know who you are on this live stream, you know who you are. They went behind everyone's back, went to the chancellor, the dean, whatever, cut bargains and deals that would that directly compromised these mobilizations and movements, meaning that they, 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 in a really literal sense, sold them out, right? Not metaphorically, they literally sold them out. All right, so that's to say that I think we, um, I think we need to understand the university, um, for those of us who work there, uh, I'm gonna say this is, I'm gonna, this is, this is a poem that I'm gonna say, okay? okay? We, need to, we need to understand the university as a site of guerrilla warfare. I learned that from, again, from the late, great Dr. James Turner. Told me that as I was leaving school with him, and, he, and I asked him, like, how the hell have you been doing this for this long? They burned down Africana Studies like the second year you were here, what's up? And he broke it down and said, you have to be, you have to think of yourself as an intellectual guerrilla fighter, which means you're naming these sites these sites as, as actual sites of guerrilla warfare. It took him probably 10 or 15 years to understand he wasn't Professor Turner, who's passed away, so you can't get him. He was not being metaphorical. I thought he was. Mm -hmm. I was not even going to think he was, but he, he meant it in a literal sense mm -hmm. that it's a site. Um, and of course, there's a long history of that, too, that I began to appreciate as, you know, as, as, I, as I studied and learned more. Um, so I think that there's an antagonism that we need to name and really may, may, maybe, maybe in certain moments just need to pick sides on this. There's an antagonism between um, folks in these places who are really invested in transforming the university. Mm. Right now, I'll say for probably 15 to 17 years, that was my investment, mm. was transforming the university. Um, and then I think, again, apologies, but not apologies for the dichotomy. I'm just mapping it out for the sake of politics here. There's another, there's another side which is, I think, undertaking a version of what I'm trying to echo back from, from, from James Turner, which is guerrilla warfare against the university. Those two things are probably, in, they're irreconcilable. Um, um, and, and, and to the extent that if I'm gonna do this kind of work of transforming the university, I see that strictly as tactical, right? It's triage work, it's casualty management work, right, Carmen? I and mean, this is what we're talking about, right? We're trying to like help each other just as coworkers, colleagues, comrades, like make it to the, the that's not transformative, that's not liberation. I mean, the topic of this thing is liberation. Like, that ain't liberation, that's, that's like, that's triage, that's casualty management. So um, I think there, we, we need to have some political clarity on what the stakes are of what we're doing. I'm listening to you and I'm trying to figure out where I stand on it. No, me too. Yeah, mostly because I'm like, oh, it's like the Malcolm move where Malcolm is like, you could get with this or you could get with that, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, like, you know, you could get with this kind of more radical, like, this can be taken apart if you continue, or you could sort of get in line with something that looks more progressive. So, and, you know, universities, you know, and the other thing I'm thinking about is I'm thinking about the, I'm thinking about the toll, just, yes. yeah. I was thinking about the psychic toll, yes. right? Yeah. Like, I remember in 2009, um, yeah, Ed, what you want to say? Yeah, you go, I just go after you. Okay. Yeah, it is time for some questions. Yeah. I know. So y'all get ready. Um, um, I was thinking about in 2009 when I finished my PhD, um, Chandra Mahanti came to Emory. I did my PhD at Emory. She came to Emory and she gives a talk. Um, and she begins this talk by reciting, reciting a litany of black women professors who had yes. died at like yep. age 59 or 60. Yes. 
Emory's my fucking alma mater, so I can say, so she lost a job that day. Mm -hmm. She clearly didn't come to play nice to get the job mm -hmm. because she, this what was, was a job. job talk? Oh, yeah, it was, okay. it was a job talk in WGSS oh, wow. at my alma mater. That was my department, though. Um, I, my degree is in American Studies. Um, and um, she comes to, you know, so she does the job talk. You know, we heard later, because there was a grad student on the committee who was like, I will not be confidential about these deliberations. You know, the, the like derisive things that this committee said about the talk, right? Um, and I, I loved it as this moment of like, women of color solidarity. Like Chandra Mahanti was putting up, like she was saying, this is where I stand. These are who my people are. That's why it matters. But, it, but also that meant that as a young black woman coming out of the academy, I was like, so the place will kill me? In 30 years, like, I might be gone, yeah. fucking with y'all. Like, yeah. I just want to teach these classes and write a book or two. Like, what, it, what is violent about that? And so when you say it becomes a place of warfare, increasingly I see that to be true. And the more ensconced you become in the university, the more people really do start to fuck with you. Like, they really do, like, jockey with you for position and shit. Yeah. And you do have to, like, figure out an orientation to it. And I wonder, but here's, but my question is, we have to be here because our people, the students who don't have anybody who looks like them, sounds like them, has a perspective that is going to be liberatory for them, if we're not here, they don't have it. Because I remember a few months later when I walked into my classroom for the first time and a black girl saw me, and I was a 28-year-old professor. And I saw her eyes sparkle because all of a sudden, her whole set of possibilities expanded. It fucking matters. That shit matters. And yet, the cost of it matters too. Why is it that the liberation, like we're not talking about liberation as theory, we're talking about the real material consequences of being in these institutions, how they destroy places, but also then how they seem to take out whole generations of scholars of, typically with scholars of color. Right, who are showing up to do this work. And so what then do we do about that? Because I don't know that we have the choice to always like abscond, mm -hmm. right? And at the same time, we are then living with the weathering processes, the debility mm -hmm. that the university produces in the name of being scholars. Mm -hmm. And that deserves to be handled too. Go get it. Yeah, right. yeah add in this, add in this, and whatever y'all want to say. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank you all for your provocations. And yeah, I'm also old school, and uh, I'm in this department. I was one of the founders of this department, so we went through the whole having to justify our existence yep. that this was a field. And I'm also a you know, non disciplinary trained person. I wanted to introduce a, a, a concept that we haven't really talked about, which is uh, subjectification. Mm -hmm. um, because, and I want to be really old school and, and uh, shout out to uh, Althusser, um, who you know talks about education as the dominant ISA. And one of the things he says about teachers, and he says, well, I know the institution is the dominant ISA, but I'm not calling out all teachers who are in in university or certain schools because teachers are trying to do liberation work in their classrooms and. To understand that you know liberation is not a linear process; it's intermittent. Mm -hmm. You know, it moves in all different kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think you know we don't necessarily appreciate, and I always I'm the graduate director here, I've done it for a long time, um, and I try to explain to students who are doing their PhDs because I think it's different at undergraduate and graduate levels of like what people's investments are and what's going on. But I try to explain to students that actually the hardest part of doing a PhD. It's not the intellectual work. It's not the trying to think about change. The hardest part is actually being subjectified mm -hmm. so that you can become a viable subject. Uh -huh. And that, that's the trade-off that's entailed with taking a, a position in an institution. Uh -huh. And the thing about that is, one, we don't talk about it. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. it's, yeah. uh, it's appears, it's, appears to be self-evident, or people really don't even understand how much work that entails and how much damage it can do to people, especially in a disciplinary context where I do think disciplines are violent. I think mean, disciplines ask you to cut off your imagination in various kinds of ways so that you can be in a box, and I think they are mutilated. I think it actually is psychically, physically bad for your health. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, but I think by adding in a question about how are we subjectified 
and what kinds of subjects can we become? I don't necessarily know that you know one needs to become a guerrilla, you know, warrior <laughs> in the academy, but but by understanding that relentlessly we are put in these positions, and also to understand the academy. I agree, it's a it's a concept, but universities have changed so much in my 35 years at Rutgers. And now the way in which the financial industry runs yeah. universities and university administrations, you know, it's all about bond ratings, yeah. right? And it's not about these are teaching institutions. And I don't know about you, but I mean, I was drawn here. There is a vocational aspect. Teachers changed my life, you know, made it possible for me to be a queer man, you know, doing work on lesbian, you know, on sexuality and be in the world. And you know, and I think those are really important spaces to hold up. And I don't think our administrators, you know, are now with that project. So, you know, in terms of like thinking about who are we as, as subjects, as educated subjects, as educating subjects, you know, what are the challenges and what are the possibilities for other ways of being that, that it's helpful sometimes to think about the ways to, you know, end with Alice's there, that we're interpolated. Right? How are we called into this? And then the ways in which, how do we, you know, in call and response, we're called, how do we respond? Right, and that that's, for me anyway, you know, and I'm looking forward to retiring, but, you know, <laughs> but then, that's what's kept me going for a long time here. And I have to say, I mean, the classroom here in our world, we're really lucky. Rutgers students are amazing, undergraduates, and the ones who self-select into our world are doubly amazing, yeah. and every day that I walk in, I mean, I've been teaching here for 35 years, and I still love it, mm -hmm. um, and it really is amazing. So I'm sorry that it's not that way at Northwestern, but I do want to give a shout out to our students mm -hmm. um, that, you know, it keeps me going here. Anyway. Yeah, so, um, I wanted to ask, okay, I want to ask Gary, but I want to ask everybody too. So, Gary, your generation trained my generation. So your peers, and I'll speak very like specifically, Gary, Ron Takaki, Elaine Kim, you know, this generation, you know, Berkeley, Third World Liberation. And we had these models, and also, you know, in black studies, we had June Jordan, we had, I mean, Barbara Christian. These were, these were my professors as an undergrad, and they were heroic, like, to, you know, watching that. I'll just speak very personally. You walk, and, and they gave everything at such incredible personal expense. Mm -hmm. And for us, you know, me, you, we were all Berkeley, you know, a bunch of us. It was phenomenal to watch the labor that they put in, and it was so deeply appreciated, and it made us who we are, right? And so when we came into these spaces, we wanted to give that to our students. Mm -hmm. And then we heard these lists, and then we read the obituaries, and we realized, fuck! Yeah. And can I do that? Am I? Can I? Am I willing? So I think so many of us now are in this space, and I'm, you know, I've got my students now. And I'm like, I can't tell you to do that, and I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I'm not, I'm sorry. Yeah. Right? And so I kind of feel like that's also a place. It's like, I mean, I do love it here. I love these students. I love you all. I love that we're having this conversation. But I'm not doing that, and you're not doing that, we're not doing that. So how do we bring that same type of, you know, like, you know, we were taught to be organic intellectuals. That was like the word. Y'all right? are organic <laughs> intellectuals, Gramsci, blah, blah, blah. You know? <laughs> and it's like, well, okay, but I was, you know, I got laundry, and I got, you know, kid, you know, and I got to do this stuff, and I can't bring that. And I think that's sort of, you know, you just started in ethnic studies. Part. It took so much work. I guess the question is, how do we do this right now? Like, we still need to make these places for our students. We need, still need to have that classroom space. Even though they all have a phone, I'm like, don't effing <laughs> record me. Like, like, shut up. You know, we're all being surveilled anyway. Like, how do we do this right now? Mm -hmm. Like, very practical question. Yeah. Like, as humans, as people, as you know, finite sources of energy. <laughs> because now we need it more than ever for these kids. But we, you know, what can we do? Mm -hmm. What are you all doing? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I don't need to shut. No, not at all. What? That was to you. 
It was yeah. kind of to Gary, like yeah. you. T- I you're, you like, said, I don't know how the question is. Like, well, you, you know, said some. Not, you not, said some. Not, you're, you're still teaching. You're, you're still teaching. You set such an example. You know what you all brought. You know you were leading movements. You were writing these things. You were thinking these new ways of thinking. Te- you know, leading these movements, and you're still teaching. So you have you see these students now. Like, what do they need now? What do we do now? What can we offer now? What is going to do? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, from hindsight. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess in hindsight, which is really important, by the way, I'm appreciating that more and more. Um, there are a lot of things that you can do, and there are a lot of things that are just happenstance, luck. Mm-hmm. Um, I was able to write four hours a day every day, except Sunday. I was lucky to sit down and plan like the 15 or 20 books that I were going to write for my whole career. Um, But I had that luxury. I know because I began my career at a teaching institution and my full-time work was teaching. Um, And then there's a family And there are family responsibilities, children and so forth. If you have children, um, it became also uh, another kind of responsibility that I had to cope with. But I was lucky again, you know. So, like, I understand that kind of thing. I think that um, it requires, I think, what happens is ultimately a kind of discipline which I was against disciplines, but a kind of discipline that I sat down four hours every day to write. That's a you discipline. Right? <laughs> but it's also a luxury, right? Yeah. But you have to make the time. You know what I mean? Like there's all kinds of things. Meetings, things to go, community work, whatever. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do. But like I decided early on that my contribution would be my writing. Then after I'm done with that, I think my contribution is teaching. Um, like I love my students now. I devote my whole energy towards teaching. Um, so at different points in your life, you have different kinds of opportunities, time to do stuff, energy, interests, and so forth. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say that people can prescribe for you what you need to do, okay? Like, I'm not Cornell West, and I'm not a like that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Offer wisdom, words of wisdom. No, I'm not into that kind of stuff, all right? Like, I think people need to decide for themselves what they prioritize and what they can do. Um, I just decided for myself, these are the directions that I'm and I understand in retrospect that it's luck and also um, one's own work. Yeah. What you have to say, though? You look like you got something to say. I have one, I have one mm-hmm. a very, I'm going to be un- uncharacteristically short with responses that we are building on. I, what do we do with and for students? Uh, it's, it's this, I realize it's kind of the same thing I think I always strive to do with students, which is to to both tell them and show up for them in a way that communicates, I am with you against them. Yeah. Mm. Oh, I need to communicate one thing. I'm sorry. Uh, I asked my students, my current students, about this session and about whether or not liberation still has meaning in their lives. Today, them, in the classroom. They said that's a no-brainer, okay? They want what we're talking about oh. in terms of liberation. How I know the varieties it? of liberation, but I'm talking about the kind that we talk about in our classroom, mm-hmm. right? Um, and they love it. That's what they say, to tell you all that. And it has relevance to their lives every day. I ask them how Grouchy applies to their lives today, for example, you see? That's what I ask them. Mm-hmm. And they find it meaningful. Mm-hmm. So. 
Yeah, I, I, I find a lot, I get a lot of inspiration from Gen Z and, and I'm hoping Gen A just because I see that the needle has somehow moved. I saw this recent uh, editorial in the New York Times complaining, saying how is it possible that half of Gen Z supports Palestine and not everybody, like we're supposed to, right? So if this older person, right? Um, and, and the fact that I don't think it's only us. I don't think that, I think there's a lot of reasons why Gen Z is more critical about capitalism, colonialism, climate change. Like they're very self-aware and they're also very vulnerable and anxious, but I love them in their complex, uh, you know, it's hard to generalize because it's very complex and there's no such thing as, it's a construct in some ways, these generational divides. But I think the needle is moving in a way like, I, I'm, I'm an optimist at the end of the day. I don't want to lose hope. I'm hoping that we'll survive all these crises that humanity has <laughs> put on itself. Um, and it depends. And so, yeah, I get as difficult as the work of, like, I get most of my joy from teaching. Um, I've slowed down after tenure in terms of publications because I'm a liberal arts college. I have to teach a ton. But I love teaching. I love having those moments of seeing them understand helping them understand how the world works. So for example, a lot of them, they were asking like, we don't need to know the history of Palestine and Israel. We don't know, can you tell us, right? Simple things like that, they, and they, but they're hungry for that knowledge and they want that history and they are, they are skeptical of black and white narratives and they're skeptical of, of simplistic narratives. Um, so that makes me hopeful that we could literally survive as a species. Um, so that's one of the things that keeps me going. Yeah, when I think of liberation, I, I still think of it always as tied to armed revolution, and I'm not engaged in that at this moment. And so for me, what, what I'm continuing to at do is... Moment. At this moment. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and... Yeah. Things change. You know, I don't know. So that's that's what how I pair it. But um, for me at this moment, I see individually, like what I have done is always put work before my kids. Um, and and that's a hard, it's a hard compromise. Um, but in my role, I, hold on a sec. They're here with me, what am I worried about? I know, you get your kids with me. No, that's okay. So I work within the institution, and I just program build. That's what I try to do. So there was, I'm too shaky, hold on a sec. You're good, you're fine. It's good. Sometimes we tell the truth. Yeah. So we help to create the Latino Studies program, and then we help to create the Native American Indigenous Studies program. So to me, the work that is getting done is, is always fighting, always fighting. Mm -hmm. And also always saying no fighting. to like, I think it's related to the topic of the seminar, is saying no to like when I was tapped, like would you be the DEI uh, of the grad school? And I was like, don't you know me? <laughs> like, you don't know me. So always having that, that I have a very clear line, I think I see, in very much the way that Dylan has articulated that there is the fighting the administration even as I'm a director of a program or you know uh, as a faculty member I will never ever go above that Out of yeah. ne yeah. never <laughs> and always being there with the students and these days that means the students had asked us would you write a letter they asked me as director of Asian American Studies will you write a letter uh, in support of Palestinian students you know etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and then the child who was stabbed, six, the six-year-old yeah, child, yeah. who was stabbed 26 times, and the mother, and he died, and this was in a suburb of Chicago, yes. you know, and we're in Evanston, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And so we did write a letter, um, and the students have told us, you, you know, you folks are one of the few people who are writing the letter. There were also, the other thing to think about is that there were um, Middle East, North Africa studies, faculty who are predominantly white women who wrote a letter and they were not doxxed publicly on C on Fox News Twitter their emails were they're not screenshotted their presidents did not get hate mails about being anti-semitic despite the fact that I am Jewish so I think it's exactly that it's being there for the students and being very having them know and trust that you are there for them um, constantly fighting the administration, but I'm tired of that, and like I feel like my kids are like, why are we here at a conference <laughs> on our day Hang out with my kids. But yeah, <laughs> so, so fighting and just working within to continue to build those spaces, it's very tedious and logistical and uh, feels counter to revolution. Mm -hmm.
I want to come to you, um, but I want to just I want to sit just with that tension for a moment because part of the thing is that sometimes, you know, I think that we only know how to work because we watch people work. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, it's like all I did every day was watch my mama and my grandmama and all of these folks work, mm -hmm. and for me, that was the labor of love, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and building legacy and building institutions and not for the institution's sake, but for the sake of the folks who are coming, right? Okay. And sometimes I do think that what we owe to our parents, if we owe them anything, is the ability to recognize that they get to be full people too, and that that gives us the freedom to be full people. And sometimes it takes a minute to get there. So I appreciate you, because we, also this is a feminist department, and we pro-parent here, and um, when we wrote, when my colleagues and I wrote Feminist AF, one of the, um, which is a, a book for young adults, one of the things we said to them was like, give your parents a little bit of grace. Because yeah. sometimes, you know, everybody is not called on to have to actually build freedom structures for people to thrive in. And there are people who are called on to do that. And so, some, and, that, and that's also part of being in the struggle too, is being able to empathize with that thing, right? And so, yeah. Young people are sophisticated. They can hold complexity. Sure. <laughs> That's right. Um, what you want to say? Um, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I think I'm thinking very practically in terms of uh, the topic that was brought up about subjectivity in the academy slash university. And I'm curious, you know, how you see a future of different kinds of academics inhabiting this liberatory process of our work. I say this from a, just a very practical standpoint as being in this university as a non-tenure track person mm -hmm. who um, has a very supportive department um, and does work outside of the norm of what a usual uh, research professor would do. And I find that very liberating and I find it very exciting but it's also often not recognized, and also people don't know what to do with that. And I know there's so much, you know, just hearing our colleague introduce herself with this, this song was wonderful, and there's so many um, different practices at work in this room that are very exciting. I, I want to see more of that, and I want to hear how you can imagine different kinds of subjectivities in terms of even just roles within the university. say something about that because <laughs> I know a little something about that um, but let me I, I want to loop your questions and ends together by saying one of the thing one of the roles that I will not I will not play nice with the university about that I do think that they're trying to interpolate us all as is, is entrepreneurs oh my God. right so it's all raise your own money and manage your own funds and if you can't do it then we'll you know basically jettison whatever priorities I just launched a lab here and uh, we're doing grant raising, and so we were applying for a federal grant, and they were like, oh, yeah, well, we take 37% off the top. What? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, yeah, they take 30, yeah, they, they, oh, they yeah. take it yeah. off the top in indirect cost, and yes. then they still charge yeah. you a bunch of money. If you want to pay your labor or somebody else's yeah. labor, then they charge you another, you know, shit ton of money on top of that. And I was like, so you haven't written shit, you haven't conceived of shit, and I'm taking all extra work, and you don't get paid? Yeah. At, Absolutely fuck not. Um, and so, so I, so I was saying to the Norman chair, I was like, we're gonna have to have a conversation with this university about the fact that if y'all want us out here raising grant monies or whatever you want, we're gonna have to talk about, you know, you creating a structure where there's that, where there's incentive to do that, right? Because one of the things that is both exciting and hard, um, the, so this is the other way that I'm thinking about this. So, a lot of my work is in the public, um, and that intentionally. Um, but I also, by nature, am an institution builder. And the challenge is because we were, I was brought up through the, you know, through training, not the account, but through the university by black women institution builders. So they feel like home to me. I'm also a church girl. So all that institution building stuff is deep, right? And yet you feel, you get exploited. Universities will absolutely let you institution build and then they will not reward it, right? 
And then they will continue to make you well, yeah, and then they will spend their time making you like justify the value of the thing you're doing. And then every time they need diversity, they'd be like, Where the blacks at? Where the browns at? Where you know, put y'all on the flyer and you haven't done shit but make me spend my time arguing about why this is valuable, right? Um, and so so the other side to that though is so one of the reasons that I when I came to workers that I wanted to come is because there were a generation of black women scholars here who actually took it as their job, not only to build fields and disciplines, which they did, but to look out for us. And so when bullshit happens, you call Cheryl Wall, rest her soul. And when bullshit happened, you call Deborah Gray White. And they, they also had their homegirls. And we have like a, a time that we get together every year. Black women come from all over the East Coast to show up at one of these people's houses for this potluck that we do, where we just, tell each other how this is supposed to go. Um, and so now all of those women are retired or gone. And I have been thinking about what is my commitment or role or responsibility to be in their legacy. Because it's not just enough to extend their scholarship, right? They literally made it safe for me. Those women read my dissertation when I came here as a postdoc. And then they to, went to meetings with me when I needed to fight to get a promotion, yeah. right? And so I keep thinking about the demands of careerism and shine and publicity over against the thankless work of institution building. Mm -hmm. right. and, the, and the way that, like there's a whole part of my career where I could just turn my head, ass to Rutgers and say, I'm gonna teach these classes and go make my money elsewhere. And then there's this version of it where I come into the institution and I build because people deserve to have it if they're here and because I'm a beneficiary of it. And all of a sudden my conversation goes down because I'm building the lab, I'm not on the road collecting speaker checks, you know what I mean? So that's like real, those are like real pragmatic political choices that you gotta make about who you wanna be in the institution and what kind of building do you wanna do and when I'm looking at scholars who are younger than me, most of them are like, we ain't doing that institution building shit because what is the return? And I don't know what to say to them. But I do have some very clear sense that we are perhaps leaving whole legacies of in intellectual and political work on the table. Um, and I don't know how we sit in the tension of that. I do not know at the end of this panel how you hold the, the imperative to want to stay well or at least just not to give the place everything with the fact that you want to build and everything is not about capitalism and money. Because if the black women who had been here before thought everything that was about money, then black women like me would not exist. And so we can't critique capitalism and neoliberalism and then monetize everything we do. But the institution wants to exploit that sensibility and we know, right? And then, you're like, well, I could just work in all these other mediums and I reach more people, right? But the day-to-day -day slow work of building relationships that sustains that work matters infinitely more sometimes than the person that read your tweet. It just does. Yeah. So I don't know the answer, but I know that what has to be clear, and you know, and I, and I do want to say this, um, Gary, is that part of the reason I said who are your people, because I'm asking you the black way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not asking you the, you know, I'm asking you the black way because when black people ask you that, yeah. they're asking you something real particular, yes. right? In order to locate you, in, you know, they're trying to locate right. you, right? And they're trying to make sure you know who you are too, mm -hmm. right? And so when I'm saying that, I'm saying that because if you, my friend Cherie Davis, who is a professor here, she says to me, every time I roll into an institution, I have an agenda there because I know that that institution has an agenda and their agenda is never gonna trump my agenda. So whatever, and she says, and if I don't have an agenda for myself in the institution, their agenda for me is going to override me. And so you, we all, whatever we do, the, the institution wants to subjectify us. They want to interpolate us into particular kinds of actors. So we have to have an agenda about the selves we get to be here that are very different from the selves they think they're going to allow. And I do think that that is some of the liberatory praxis of these disciplines that we work in, is that we keep on reimagining what cells we get to be in places like this, right? Yeah. 
Yes, okay. And then this okay. question. Can I respond to that question? Sorry, I promise I'll hand you the mic. And then we're going to have Yep, got it. Okay. Um, I want to respond to your question about a future with different types of academics. I want to say, I think you might have asked an unintentionally overly optimistic question. <laughs> I'm mean, going to bring you back to, uh, Brittany, your quoting of, of, of my good friend, Mary Kaba, um, which I've heard and quoted a lot, right? The idea of hope is a discipline. Yeah. Um, also, discipline is a hope. Um, but, but, it's a, but, it's, but, but I want to say something about, and I'm not saying you did this, but I'm saying, like, I've heard a lot of people use that quotation all the time, hope is a discipline. Sure. I also want to tell you, just from knowing Mary, and Mary, if you see this, correct me if I'm wrong, what, she, what, what MK also means by that is that hope is not indiscriminate. So that's not, saying hope is a discipline is not permission to be hopeful about every fucking thing. Yeah, no. Right, it's the opposite. Yeah. Be, yeah. Be, be discriminating about what it is you choose to invest hope in. So yeah. I say that I think, so let me talk about, just for a second, about the unintentional optimism of the question. I mean, um, I mean it this way. One is that um, I think that there may not be a future in which there are different types of academics. Right. Um, and I'm saying, I bet you it's within most of our lifetimes here. Um, that you're you're looking in the in, in kind of you're looking down the barrel of a university where there are no teachers. Effectively, there are no teachers, especially no permanent teachers. Um, we're we're already looking at the disappearance and obsolescence. I mean, the institutionalized obsolescence of tenure and tenure track positions. Mm -hmm. That's already happening. Various public institutions are doing it. Private institutions are doing it. Um, the rough anal analogy is one of my one of my friends is a um, longtime pediatrician um, in the Riverside County area. Um, we went, you know, I changed my healthcare plan to this helpful, horrible Kaiser Permanente, kill you permanently, um, because he's one of the few black pediatricians in the area. And, and so, anyway, so he's become a family friend, and his his son is now going to college, and, and he's telling he's a, so he's obviously he's got a medical degree and all that stuff, and he's counseling his son to pursue um, a, his professional degree in uh, in nursing and to become a nurse practitioner. And he broke it down for me. And he said that the rough analogy is that in the medical profession, they're actually obsoleting doctors. Right? That more, more and more hospitals are like eliminating doctor positions, expanding um, nurse practitioner positions, et cetera. So that's already happening in other parallel institutions. So we gotta pay attention to that shit. Like, so there may not be a future that way. The other thing too, and, and this is something that we fought when I was um, the chair of our academic senate, is that university administrations, they're taking ownership of all of your course materials. Yeah. Right? They actively are taking ownership and appropriating that, especially stuff that's online, especially stuff that's recorded. And so what you're also looking at is, a, is an immediate future in which there's going to be coursework in, there, in which there is no human teaching it. Because the university already owns your materials. They'll just put your fucking syllabus up there, they'll put a bunch of recorded lectures up there, students will do a kind of automatic canvas exam, and they'll get Chris. That's, that's, and that's not some far away future, that is the immediate future. Um, so it's to say, on the other hand, that if there is a future, the future is a future of study. It's a future of study. It may be a future of study that does not include universities um, or, or academia, right? Or academics, for that matter. It's a future that will include study, which means we all still to, we we will all still be engaged with that. But it might not be in the institutional form that we're talking about now. And, and again, I think this is imminent. I don't think this is something far away. Sorry for the long thing. Okay. We'll do one more. No, go ahead. No, no. That's last question. Not sure. Mostly, perhaps a comment. Um, I'm Priscilla. I'm an um, assistant professor in geography and Latino Caribbean studies here at Rutgers. Um, and you know, I was. I'm, I'm still resonating with the question, like you know, how to. Um, I missed the word, but how to. Um, how to incite students, maybe that's the question, right? Inspire, right? And I, you know, as an international faculty here, um, I, I feel like I'm, I have a hard time, not a hard time, but I, I'm learning how to love students here. And I think the reason why I'm saying that is because um, I, I, I went to college in Sao Paulo, and from my first year, um, freshman in college, um, we had occupied one of the buildings uh, in psychology, teaching evening classes, all, all subject matters, every evening and Saturday morning to public school students to prepare them for the pre very competitive and elitist college entrance exams. Uh, and I did that all throughout you know, college and then, and then after that. Um, and it's still existing 20 years in the same place, right? Completely independent. No student union money, no no political parties money, no nothing. So, you know, at the time when we had strikes, they were like, they'll last three months, four months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I'm saying, we'll pile up 
chairs and then nobody gonna teach here. Like we actually occupied mm -hmm. the president building for three months. Yeah. And people are like, the police is coming with like pepper and the like, dropping, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. And so here it's like, when is my, what's my midterm review? It's taking you a week to give me whatever A I think I deserve. So I'm trying to learn. If you all have any in, like any, any shares into how to develop that kind of love when I see very little um, passion for learning itself in its depth, right? So I'll, Welcome those. And then I think in terms for us as colleagues, I'm, you know, I'm always constantly thinking about how is it that we engage in um, institutional, building, uh, institutional building from the standpoint of confronting excess in a very strategic way to create the spaces outside of here when this like under, um, yeah, I don't have the words, but when you, it's done already. Like we 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 are obsolete. I think. Yeah. And like and the people are like, you know, how are we gonna deal with you know the chat chat DPT? And yeah. I'm like, you want me to police students, right? You have like 300 students in a class, and you want me to police them? Fuck that. Yeah. I don't care about intellectual property in that kind of way, yeah. right? And and so you don't yeah. either, right? So I'm thinking like, how is it that in the you know in the ways that we construct and build institutions, we are like so shocked with. I am so shocked with how much money circulates around here. Yeah. Just even like a speaker fee is like a thousand dollars. Like I can't get paid speaker fee for being an international scholar. I can't. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? But like when I'm like people are getting paid five hundred dollars to do what they do. Like that. I don't know where else in the world that shit's happening. Mm -hmm. Like what are we doing with those fees? You know what I'm saying? Oh, that, that and maybe that fee is way too low, not a thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Exactly. No, no, no. We consider a thousand dollars exploitative. Okay. Like I don't sue me four thousand dollars unless you're my friend. I speak for many times that. That's many right. Times. That's right. So, yeah, I mean, to your point, but I'm like, don't even tell anybody if they be like a thousand. I'm not coming. For exactly. <laughs> but then you know, and then what I'm I'm constantly thinking about is like, how is it that we are diverging? excessiveness or even understanding what excessiveness is right like there are no meeting here in this university where there's like no like i just organized the global black geographies conference forty thousand dollars you know forty thousand dollars we're like bringing more room communities from brazil Lynn Les Pazin organized favela organizers and people are like what the like yeah. <laughs> like we can organize our maroon school in five years yeah. with that kind of money so like what I had to do was a lot of like confronting the all the very ways that I'm like wet like my writing has been weaponized against me. Like my ability to write has been weaponized against me because the time I'm trying to bring them people here, just the fact that they need a visa to come here and pre-interviews and all kinds of shit make make this space a space of learning together, it cost the weaponization of my ability to write against myself. When you, well, how much have you published? When are you going to publish? When are you coming up for tenure? What the fuck are you writing, right? Yeah. So like, it, to the point that it cracks our ability to trust yeah. and love writing when it's yeah. been constantly weaponized against yeah. us. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So, yeah, I guess it's, it's an invitation to, to say, yeah. you are my people and I'm, I'm coming with you and I'm here to build the kind of institution where we come to the point and say, you know, one thousand dollars is nothing, baby. You know what I'm saying? Because we have a plan for that money. Because you got a plan for that money. So the more we get, the better. But because we have a plan yeah. together, you know. Okay. So, so, so I'm going to close this out. Thank you so much. I mean, I was wrapped. <laughs> I mean, you don't really understand. I'm hungry. I, myself, I think some of us are in, for conversations like this. I, we brought you a long way to have this conversation, so thank you so much. Um, we are going to take a short break right now. I, I, it's been a long day already. We have another panel that's going to follow. I actually hope that panel unfolds its Rutgers faculty as more of a conversation because I feel like this has become a conversation. Um, so thank you so much. We got still have food and snacks outside. Please take 15 minutes. Um, we'll reconvene uh, about 10, 10, 15 minutes after the hour again. All right. Thank you, everyone. Natasha.